All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Susan Howley, and I'm the project director for the Center for Victim Research. We are so glad you are joining us here today. Um, before we get to today's presentation, it's my job to quickly review the mechanics of the webinar. So first, the icons under the list of names. Um, our presenters may ask for a show of hands today. So if you look, you'll see a hand icon right down that strip there of icons. If you can practice that and um, raise your hands, uh, you probably can't give a little wave, but go ahead, show me that you can use that. Very good. I see those numbers flipping up. Okay. Thanks for those of you raising your hand. And now if you click on it again, it will disappear. Our presenters may also ask, uh, ask for some comments or for some input, and you will be invited to ask questions during this session. So if you look down in the questions tab and, and open that, go ahead and tell us where you are, uh, where you're watching from, and how hot it is right now. Let's see what comes in. Go ahead and try out that question tab. Where are you watching? And how, how, oh, Canton, Georgia is very hot. Greensburg, Pennsylvania in the 90s already. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of 90s out there. Wisconsin, let's all go to Wisconsin. It's only in the mid 70s. Great, look at that. Oh, Indiana, Ohio, Virginia suffering. <laughs> all right, and it's still technically June. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so I encourage you to use that question box. Ask your questions at any time. We will be keeping track of them. And then if they haven't been answered during the presentation, we'll raise them during Q&A time. You have got some fantastic experts on today. So take this opportunity and ask them all the questions that you've been dying to ask. And then finally, before we get started, I want to let you know there will be a webinar feedback survey sent to you immediately after today's session. Please take that survey. Uh, we really do use the information that you provide. And that survey will also be your opportunity to request a certificate of attendance or a copy of today's presentation. And with that, let me just pause so that we have a clean start to our recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Preventing and Reducing Violence Against Older Adults. My name is Susan Howley, and I'm with the Center for Victim Research, and it is my very great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Kia Marshall Mullins is a PH, uh, Master of Public Health and um, and a doctor of public health. She's a behavioral scientist in the research and evaluation branch at the Division of Violence Prevention at the CDC. That is a mouthful. Dr. Mullins received her degrees from the University of North Texas Health Science Center School of Public Health. Since 2009, she's worked on the prevention of HIV and AIDS and violence. This includes identifying evidence-based HIV interventions and best practices, and also co-leading the CDC's Youth Violence Prevention Centers. Dr. Mullins also works to address health equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts at the CDC. Jeffrey Herbst, PhD, is the Chief of Research and Evaluation Branch in the Division of Violence Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Injury Center. Dr. Herbst has a doctoral degree in psychology from the University of Maryland's Graduate School in Baltimore and over 30 years of research and public health experience. He oversees a portfolio of research and evaluation studies to prevent multiple forms of violence in the United States. Dr. Herbst has published over 100 articles in psychology and public health. Joy Ernst is an associate professor of social work at Wayne State University. She is also the, a Hartford Geriatric Social Work faculty scholar, and her research interests include elder mistreatment and adult protective service programs. She's published articles on elder self-neglect, the use of multidisciplinary teams at APS, geriatric enrichment and social work education, and more. She serves on the research committee for the National Adult Protective Services Association, where she has worked on projects including a review of the research on adult protective services, published in the Journal of Elder Abuse and Neglect. 
We are so delighted to have this team with us today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Kia. Great, thanks, Susan. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, it looks great. Great. Um, once again, thank you, Susan. And good morning and good afternoon. We are delighted to be here for today's Center for Victim Research webinar. For today's discussion, Dr. Jeff Herbst will provide an overview of elder abuse. I would then discuss how violence against elders is preventable. And finally, I'll provide an overview and findings from our recent systematic review of review. Now, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Jeff Hurt. Jeff? All right, thank you, Kia. If you could advance the slide, please. And one more time. Elder abuse is an intentional act or failure to act that causes or creates a risk of harm to an older adult. An older adult is someone aged 60 years or older. The abuse often occurs at the hands of a caregiver or a person the elder trusts. Common types of elder abuse include physical abuse, is when an elder experiences illness, pain, injury, functional impairment, distress, or death as a result of the intentional use of physical force and includes acts such as hitting, kicking, pushing, slapping, and burning. Sexual abuse involves forced or unwanted sexual interaction of any kind with an older adult. This may include unwanted sexual contact or penetration or non-contact acts such as sexual harassment. Emotional or psychological abuse refers to verbal or nonverbal behaviors that inflict anguish, mental pain, fear, or distress on an older adult. Examples include humiliation or disrespect verbal or nonverbal threats, harassment, and geographic or interpersonal isolation. Neglect is a failure to meet an older adult's basic needs. These needs include food, water, shelter, clothing, hygiene, and essential medical care. And finally, financial abuse is the Ill illegal, unauthorized, or improper use of an elder's money their benefits, belongings, property, or assets for the benefit of someone other than the older adult. Next slide, please. Elder abuse is a serious problem in the US. Studies estimate that between 4.6 to 10% of American older adults experience some form of elder abuse annually. Abuse includes neglect and exploitation, is experienced by approximately one in 10 people aged 60 years and older who live at home. It is important to keep in mind that available information regarding elder abuse is an underestimate of the problem because the number of non-fatal injuries may be limited to older adults who are treated in emergency, emergency departments and information does not include those persons treated by other providers or those who do not seek treatment. Additionally, many cases of elder abuse are not reported because elders may be afraid or unable to tell the police, their friends, or their family members about the violence. Next slide, please. A pair of recent studies suggest elder abuse increased during the COVID-19 pandemic and impacted both older persons as well as their caregivers. Chang and Levy conducted a survey from April 23rd to May 5th, 2020, that included nearly 900 older persons in the US. They found that one in five or 21.3% of older persons reported elder abuse an 83.6% increase from pre-pandemic prevalence estimates. The study also uncovered two protective factors for elder abuse that included the sense of community as well as physical distancing or the social distancing guidelines. One key risk factor identified in the study included financial strain 
that was linked to their abuse. In another study, Macaroon and colleagues published a study in 2021 involving a survey of 433 caregivers of community dwelling adults over the age of 60. There were numerous impacts on caregiving, including increased physical, emotional, and financial difficulties, interference with caregivers' health care. There were also greater hardships and worry about finances, increases in alcohol consumption, and also increased feelings of social isolation and loneliness. Next slide. In a Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, or MMWR, published in 2019, CDC authors investigated trends in rates of non-fatal assaults and homicides among adults aged 60 years and older. During the study period, which was 2002 to 2016, more than 643,000 older adults were treated in emergency departments for non-fatal assaults, and over 19,000 homicides occurred. The figure depicted in this slide shows both modeled and observed non-fatal assault injury rates among adults aged 60 years and older who were treated in hospital emergency departments, and the rates are broken down by males and females across the entire study period. Rates for men are pre presented in the top dashed line. Rates for women are presented in the bottom dotted line. The total group of men and women is presented in the middle which is a solid line. As illustrated in the figure, the men, the top line, experienced higher rates of non-fatal assaults than women, the bottom line, across the entire study period. The rate of non-fatal assaults among men increased more than 75% from 2002 to 2016. The rate for non-fatal assaults among women increased more than 35% from 2007, if you see the arrow at the bottom of the figure, to 2016. Most non-fatal assaults, or over 85%, were related to being intentionally struck or hit, that is, they're with a hand, a foot, or some object. Also, I want to just alert you again that these are likely underestimates because these data are only um, accounted for among people treated in hospital emergency departments. In another study using a similar data set, the majority of older adults, or those over the age of 60, the source of the non-fatal injuries was perpetration by a person of trust. Next slide, please. The same study by Logan et al. also investigated estimated homicide rates among adults aged 60 years and older by sex for the same study period. These, are these data are based on national vital statistics data. Similar to non-fatal assaults, homicide rates were consistently higher among men, the top line, than women, the bottom line. The estimated homicide rate for men increased 7% from 2010 to 2016, the top dashed line. The estimated homicide rate for women stayed about the same, roughly 1.5 per 100,000 population across the entire study period, please see the bottom dotted line. The study authors reported that average crude homicide rates were highest among non-Hispanic Blacks, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Natives, and Hispanics or Latinos compared to non-Hispanic white older adults. Firearms were the most common weapons used in homicides at 42.2%, and other homicide mechanisms included cutting or piercing at 14.8% and suffocation at 6.4%. Next slide, please. Many victims of elder abuse suffer physical injuries. Some are minor like cuts, scratches, bruises, and welts. Other physical injuries are more serious and can cause lasting disabilities, including head injury, broken bones, constant physical pain, and soreness. Physical injuries can also lead to premature death and make existing problems worse. Elder abuse also results in emotional effects where victims are also often fearful and anxious and victims may have problems with trust and might be wary when they are around others. 
There are also financial consequences of elder abuse that cause strain among the elders as well as their caregivers and are likely associated with increased abuse. And we saw some data from the COVID pandemic that indicate that that, is, that may be the case. At this time, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Joy Ernst to add a few comments regarding the background information. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the um, something that in the elder abuse field is called poly-victimization, which is, uh, refers to experiencing multiple types of abuse. And um, someone who is suffering from poly-victimization can suffer from abuse that's occurring at the same time or sequentially. But the result is cumulative and compounding harm to older adults. For example, financial exploitation um, by a family member may be accompanied by um, neglect or physical abuse of that older adult. And so this concept of polyvictimization also recognizes that past traumas over the life course can heighten the negative impact of elder mistreatment in old age. So, for example, early childhood adversity, both experiencing and witnessing uh, mistreatment, can also exacerbate later life abuse. And one study has reported that approximately 1.7% of older people experienced prior year polyvictimization. So that's all I have. So I guess we're turning it over to um, Dr. Mullins now. Thank you, Dr. Ernst. As previously mentioned, elder abuse is preventable. At the CDC, we use a public health approach to guide our violence prevention work. The public health approach includes four steps. Step one, define and monitor the problem. Step two, identify risk and protective factors. Step three, develop and test prevention strategies. And finally, step four, assure widespread adoption. The first step in preventing violence is to understand the who, what, when, where, and how associated with it. Grasping the magnitude of the problem involves analyzing data, such as the number of violence-related behaviors, injuries, and deaths. Data can demonstrate how frequently violence occurs, where it occurs, trends, and who the victims and perpetrators are. These data can be obtained from police reports, medical examiner files, vital records, hospital charts, registries, population-based surveys, and other sources. Step two, it is not enough to know the magnitude of a public health problem. It is important to understand what factors protect people or put them at risk for experiencing or perpetrating violence. So why are risk and protective factors useful? They help identify where prevention efforts need to be focused. Risk factors do not cause violence. The presence of a risk factor does not mean that a person will always experience violence. Victims are never responsible for the harm inflicted upon them. So what is a risk factor? A risk factor is a characteristic that increases the likelihood of a person becoming a victim or perpetrator of violence. A protective factor is a characteristic that decreases the likelihood of a person becoming a victim or perpetrator of violence, or it provides a buffer against risk. Step three, findings from the research literature and data from needs assessment, community survey, stakeholder interviews, and focus groups are useful for designing prevention strategies. Using these data and findings is known as an evidence-based approach to program planning. Once prevention strategies are developed or existing strategies are identified, they are then evaluated rigorously to determine their effectiveness. And finally, step four. The strategies shown to be effective in step three are then implemented and adopted more broadly. Communities are encouraged to implement strategies based on the best available evidence, and to continuously assess whether the strategy is a good fit with the community context and achieving its goal of preventing violence. Dissemination techniques to promote widespread adoption include training, networking, 
technical assistance, and evaluation. The CDC has developed technical packages to help states and communities take advantage of the best available evidence to prevent violence. The technical packages were released in 2016 and 2017 and are available for child abuse and neglect, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, suicide, and youth violence. However, there is no package for the prevention of elder abuse, which is likely due to limited evidence on strategies and approaches to prevent this form of violence. Several CDC researchers decided to conduct a systematic review of the literature to determine the state of the evidence. So what exactly is the systematic review of reviews? The systematic review process includes four steps, which attempt to collect and analyze all evidence that answers a specific question. The four steps include search, which is usually a comprehensive search of the literature. Next is appraisal, where we determine the inclusion and exclusion criteria and often assess the quality of the data. The next step, step is to synthesize, which typically involves a narrative with tables describing the data. And finally, analyze. We look at what is known and provide recommendations for practice and for future research. In 2020, we published a systematic review of reviews to determine if interventions to prevent or stop abuse and neglect among older adults work. Since several systematic reviews were published over the past decade, a review of reviews was conducted to evaluate the evidence base. A systematic review of reviews is similar to a systematic review, but instead of looking at an individual program or intervention, we take a look at a systematic review. This slide shows the inclusion criteria for our current review. To be eligible, it had to be a systematic review or made analysis. It had to focus on older adults, as stated by the authors. It had to include interventions or programs. It had to include elder abuse outcomes, such as sexual abuse or physical abuse. The publication had to be written in English and published in a peer review journal between 2000 and 2020. We focus on the last 20 years of the literature to identify these interventions. In 1997, Wolf uh, published a seminal article reviewing the existing literature at that time. This slide shows our systematic study selection process. We searched six databases. Sonal, Cochrane Library, Embase, Medline, PubMed, PsycInfo, and Scopus. I realize that the font is small, so I will provide an overview of our selection process. We, our search identified 1,150 records. After duplications were removed, we screened 791 titles and abstracts. From this, 36 unique full text articles were assessed for eligibility, with a final list of 11 unique reviews, 12 publications that were included in our systematic review of reviews. So what were the results? The major takeaway is that evidence is weak or insufficient for interventions to prevent or stop abuse and neglect among older adults. This slide includes the characteristics of the 11 unique reviews, 12 publications that met our eligibility criteria, including one meta-analysis. Included reviews mainly focus on general abuse directed toward older adults and educational interventions for professional and paraprofessional caregivers multidisciplinary teams of healthcare and legal professionals, as well as families. 
Interventions were implemented in a variety of community and institutional settings and addressed primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. The reviews reported few statistically significant intervention effects for abuse and neglect outcomes. And review authors consistently did not identify specific evidence-based interventions for widespread implementation. Some reviews reported education-based interventions were associated with improvements in knowledge of abuse among older adults, recognition and reports of abuse, and prevention of resident-to-resident -resident abuse. As presented earlier related to the COVID-19 impact, caregivers are more likely to experience work-related impairments and mental health symptoms, including anxiety and depression. This results in the time and effort needed to care for an older family member. Studies suggest policies and practices that improve household financial security and work family supports may reduce rates of abuse among older adults. Other policy approaches that might have an impact on abuse against older adults at the community or societal levels involve increased subsidies through tax credits and policies created to prevent other forms of violence. Future research is clearly needed to determine if these policies and practices are necessary to prevent or reduce elder abuse. Our systematic review of reviews show non-reviews that consistently reported weak or insufficient evidence of intervention effectiveness. Although several promising prevention practices were identified, public health providers urgently need effective interventions to prevent or reduce abuse and neglect among older adults. Future research is needed to evaluate emerging and innovative prevention policies, practices, and programs develop and evaluate the effectiveness of comprehensive prevention interventions, and develop interventions for specific populations to address inequities and access to effective prevention strategies. So how can we prevent elder abuse now? There are several important things we can all do to prevent elder abuse. We can understand and address factors that put people at risk for or protect them from violence. We can educate ourselves and others about how to recognize and report elder abuse and learn how, and learn how the signs of elder abuse differ from normal aging. We can listen to older adults and their caregivers to understand challenges and provide support. We can check in often on older adults who may have very few friends or family members. We can report abuse or suspected abuse to local protective services, long-term care, ombudsman, or the police. Use the National Center on Elder Abuse listing of state elder abuse hotlines to find your state's reporting numbers, government agencies, state laws, and other resources. It is also worth noting, mentioning that interventions are critically needed in healthcare set settings. Elders and their caregivers ought to be screened for potential abuse and neglect, and elders and caregivers should be connected to medical and social services, especially in light of potential increases in abuse and neglect during the pandemic. Provider overburdened caregivers with support, such as help from friends, family, or local relief care groups, adult daycare programs, counseling, outlets intended to promote education emotional well-being. Encourage and assist persons, either caregivers or older adults, having problems with drug or alcohol abuse and getting help. The older adult population is growing faster in the U.S. than younger populations. Many older adults require care and are vulnerable to violence perpetrated by a caregiver or someone they trust. More research is needed to uncover the causes for and solutions to violence against older adults. I'll now pass it back over to Dr. Joy Ernst. Uh, 
Hi, Joy, do you have access to the slides or shall, should Jason make you presenter? All right, and Joy, you're muted. Okay, hello everybody. Um, let me just put my screen on. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes, it's great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I am going to cover, um, you know, provide you with some thoughts um, in response to this review of reviews. And I'm going to talk a little bit about ageism and elder abuse, um, something about the complexity and heterogeneity of elder abuse and the services that we use to address elder abuse, um, talk about some of the issues um, raised by the systematic review from my perspective, some thoughts about research practitioner partnerships, and then um, conclude with just a list of what I think are helpful resources. So, um, and before I start talking about ageism and elder abuse, I also just wanted to provide you with a little information about me um, to give you a little more context. I'm a professor of social work, which means that I am engaged in the um, process of preparing um, social workers for practice in all sorts of fields. And um, of course, I want all my students to think about their role in elder abuse prevention. But I think about the types of services that my students end up working in, and those include elder abuse services, victim services, um, departments of aging, um, health and long-term care settings. They provide direct clinical services. They work as long-term care ombudsmen. They, are, um, they have policy roles as well. Um, so um, I really feel that I, one thing I'm able to do in my role is to give them some more information about elder abuse. I've also done some research on elder neglect cases in adult protective services, which means I've read a lot of case records um, and talked with a lot of APS workers about their experiences in working in the field. Um, and then I've also participated in the National Adult Protective Services Association Research for, to Practice Interest Group for over 10 years. And, just wanted um, to you know, give a shout out to that committee that we have prepared um, resources that are useful for researchers who want to partner with APS agencies and for agencies who want to partner with researchers. So before I talk about um, the review, I just want to talk a little bit about ageism and elder abuse. Now ageism is the systematic stereotyping and discrimination of people based upon their age. And we don't always recognize it when we may be practicing it, but the biases we have may lead us to see older persons in terms of the negative traits um, that, they, that, that we might associate with older people, such as being forgetful, being set in your ways, or being sick and frail and vulnerable. And this may lead us to intervene in ways that are harmful. Um, we also know that um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, reports to APS increased and social isolation probably did put a lot more people at risk, even though there were a lot of strategies put in place to respond to that as well. Um, but the pandemic also highlighted the problems of ageism with respect to um, using language described to um, older persons, such as using the term elderly to discuss older victims. And um, those who look at kind of language and age, and I'm quoting, I'm talking about the article cited here by Barrage and Hoyman, talk about terms such as the elderly being kind of an empty category in that a lot of people don't identify with the word. And I'll, I'll ask you to ask your 80 year old mother if she considers herself elderly and, and and talk and think about what answer you get. But for our purposes today, ageism also works against um, abuse prevention because it leads us to devalue older adults, which also increases their vulnerability. Now, I would like, um, if you wouldn't mind, to give me a show of hands um, about how many of you, I know there's a lot of people from victim services who've signed up for this webinar, um, and how many of you actually work on a regular basis with older adults?
All right, Joyce, so far we've got about 17% of the hands raised. Folks, oh. remember, just click on that, click on that icon. Oh, it's starting to go up if you regularly work with it with older adults. It so looks like it's 20% 20, 20 of the hands are up. Okay, okay, that that's very helpful to me in in um and hoping you know in 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 the next thing I'm going to talk about actually, um and so so with respect to this next thing, um, I want to address a little bit about the complexities of elder abuse and and this has to do with the different types of elder abuse that um, have already been described. And these different types of elder abuse compound our challenges in responding to it and addressing it. Now, elder abuse shares characteristics with um, and also is distinct from other forms of family violence. Um, notably, um, one of the distinctions is the expectation of trust in the relationship in the definition of elder abuse. And since elder abuse by definition involves older adults, we, we do need to think about the risks that are associated with the aging process, such as um, people who may have multiple health problems or declines in their physical or cognitive capacity. Elder abuse is always a very broad category. It um, includes criminal acts such as serious violence, fraud, medical neglect, and even murder which are more appropriately addressed by the criminal justice system, but there are also common situations where family members can neglect their partners or parents' needs. They may belittle or exclude them socially, threaten institutionalization, or demand money, and all these things can go into the category of elder abuse. Now, the situations are very complex as well, um, involving, for example, caregiving situations. So, for example, an older woman may not want the perpetrator, who may be her adult child, to suffer legal consequences, even if she wants abuse to stop. Some older adults have families with a history of domestic and family violence. The older adult may have been the victim and or the perpetrator of violence in the past. Some older women were physically abused by their husbands throughout their marriages, but remained in the relationships for a variety of economic and social reasons including a desire to keep a family together or a lack of resources. Their children may have witnessed the violence or were themselves victims of abuse by one or both parents. Many older women did not have access to community resources such as domestic violence shelters when they were younger. Even today, there are some programs that serve victims of domestic violence that are not always responsive to the needs of older adults. So, the, and as we transition into talking about the systematic review, I also note that there are so many services and settings that need to be involved in protecting older adults from abuse and neglect. And there are a variety of responses available depending upon the nature of the abuse in the practice setting. And so this review of reviews encompassed many different approaches, and I want to address some of the issues raised by the review next. The review of reviews highlights the need to focus on identifying the best strategies and approaches to elder abuse. We have learned that we lack evidence on effectiveness. We have also learned that more and better designed prevention and intervention research is needed. Now, the, these reviews um, covered a variety of approaches. A lot of them, um, the studies were about education about elder abuse, what it is, how to recognize and respond for professionals responsible for preventing, stopping, and getting those at risk to the organization that are better equipped to help them. Lots of studies showed that knowledge is increased, fewer studies focused, and fewer research focuses on the research on the skills needed for communication about elder abuse. Some of the reviews in this review of reviews focused on interventions and strategies designed to increase the effectiveness of healthcare professionals and systems in responding to elder abuse. This is a key area due to the frequent interaction of healthcare professionals and settings with older persons. These interventions by healthcare professionals can range from screening for abuse to educating professionals to um, <clears throat> to changing policies on how to better respond to abuse. However, a message from this review of reviews is that there needs to be better focus, not just on identifying and referring, but on how to manage elder abuse situations. One category of intervention that receives some attention 
is the use of multidisciplinary multidisciplinary teams to bring combined expertise to respond to difficult case situations. Likewise, some interventions address the needs of caregivers and had some success in reducing, for example, depression and anxiety. However, caregivers can also be the perpetrators and many of the, the reviews pointed out that there is more need for interventions that address the needs of perpetrators who may have problems with mental health or substance abuse, for example. With respect to interventions for after abuse has occurred or secondary prevention, these systematic reviews found very few, if any, studies addressed effectiveness of either adult protective services or victim services programs. Shelley Jackson wrote a helpful review that compares victim services with adult protective services. She points out that both adult protective services caseworkers and victim services providers at their core are in the business of helping victims re remedy a situation through the provision of services. Now, there are, imp are important differences and the two fields do not always agree on approaches to serving victims of elder abuse. APS receives and responds to reports of elder abuse made by mandatory reporters. APS workers also screen and have to be concerned about cognitive capacity and in some instances, but not as many as people might think, APS carries out involuntary interventions. However, there is also overlap in services offered. For example, both APS and victim services might help with things such as protective orders and law enforcement, assistance in locating another residence or place to live, financial assistance and help with personal needs. Both services respect the right of self-determination, which includes the right to refuse services. With respect to research, both of these fields need to unpack the black box to determine which aspects of their services account for changes in outcomes and which components are necessary to produce a given outcome. More services provided does not always mean more success. In addition, both provide services on a short-term basis when many victims need, may need longer-term support. So, so we've learned, we're learning that a lot of research is needed, a lot of studies of interventions. And so what might be some reasons, if you're working for an agency, that you might want to participate in research? This systematic review of reviews clearly highlights the need for more research and researchers need to partner with agencies in order to do this. As mentioned with respect to adult protective services and victim services um, and with all programs, actually the, the process of doing research forces programs to specify their intervention methods and outcomes. It helps agencies determine whether an intervention worked and importantly, for whom it worked. All of you who provide services are aware of the need to provide culturally responsive interventions in order to increase the likelihood that we can increase safety and reduce abuse, neglect, and exploitation in the diverse groups of clients and people we serve. Willingness to participate in research also helps you access resources for your program. For example, the Administration for Community Living has made funds available over the past several years to improve adult protective services in various ways. Now, there are, also, there are also some barriers to participating in research, and you may be familiar with many of these. It's important to recognize that these um, research partnerships may not be easy to set up or maintain. Adult protective services and victim services agencies, to use those as an example, are often very busy trying to provide services with limited resource and staff time. As a social work professor, I also know research is a tough sell to some students and our future social workers. Um, but if agency-based research is to be successful, it requires that agencies take time to explain its importance and, and how they are going to support workers in the event that a research project or study requires workers to take on additional work. Finally, 
and that's my last thing, there will be some who see research on program effectiveness as a way to bring to light poor job performance on the part of staff. Some staff may wonder, what will happen if there are negative results, if the intervention research shows that a program is not creating change in the desired direction? Agency administrators need to be clear about what will happen with the research findings. So thank you very much um, for allowing me to make these comments. Um, I've included some links to helpful resources on this last slide. And um, of course, there's more out there, but these are ones that I find particularly helpful as a researcher and an educator. So thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Joy. Um, and thanks, Kia and Jeff. We do have time for questions from the audience. So remember, you uh, please enter your questions into the question box. And we have had a couple of questions come in already. So let me start with those. Um, Joy, you went over some of the barriers to research. And Kia, you talked a lot about the lack of research. Can, can you uh, both try to say more concisely, um, since there has been some level of research in elder abuse for the past 30 years or so, what is it that is keeping us from having real research-based conclusions? Yes, Can Joy. I start? <laughs> I think I, well. I think one of the things, and this is um, that is, it's it's some it's sometimes it's often the quality of the research. So it's the research that does not make it into these systematic reviews that is not high quality enough to provide um, evidence that we can um, have have trust in or faith in. So, and I and I recognize if I'm speaking from a practitioner's point of view, I recognize the challenges involved in this because it's very hard, for example, to set up a uh, randomized control um, design in an agency intervention, even even to have a comparison group such as a waitlist control, is is it kind of flies in the face of of workers and agencies that that just feel the need that want to provide services and have a lot of faith in the services they provide. So that's what I'll say. And I just echo everything that Joy has stated. I think that um, most of the uh, interventions that we found were focused on the individual level, so focused on um, maybe the caregiver or healthcare worker, um, as opposed to looking at also the larger context and kind of looking at some of the structural factors, some of the policies that could be implemented. So a follow-up question was, what specific research is needed to reach conclusions to prevent elder abuse? So Kia, are you saying that what we need is to have a, a broader view and look at policies, or what other specific research do we need? I think that's part of it. And um, going back to Joy's point about um, looking at um, interventions that are like randomized and more rigorous, um, that was also one thing that we noted from the systematic reviews included. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to add anything else, or Joy. Well, right. I'll just go, go ahead, so, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Joy. So, um, yeah, that's something that we noted. We also noted some challenges with um, measurement in terms of measuring outcomes. Um, as I stated, even with the surveillance data, that there are great limitations in um, monitoring trends in non-fatal assaults among older adults because a lot of the uh, assaults are not reported. And, um, you know, the question is, um, would these uh, assaults be reported in research studies? So maybe that's a rhetorical question. And then um, what we also found um, with the existing literature is also um, variations in definitions of elders and older adults and where you draw the cut points and um, how to measure. And of course, um, individuals in their 50s are different than those in their 60s and beyond. So really, um, it could be um, very different types of interventions or types of research that could be conducted, as well as um, just bolstering what Kia said, that it's possible for um, to achieve greater um, public health impact is to look at um, some of the outer level strategies, such as um, policies, um, legal, um, um, legal uh, ramifications for abuse, and how those are enforced. 
and over to you, Joy, if you want to add. Oh, just just to take it back down to <laughs> to the um, more, you know, if you're working for an agency, kind of like, oh my God, what are they telling me to do? Frame um, point of view is also that that and that was part of the um, reason for my, you know, why get involved is that that this systematic review of reviews does touch upon so many different types of elder abuse intervention and but most of us who are working are only working for one place and um and so if we want to get our one place to participate you know what what are some of the things we can do to be supportive and i you know so i would urge the practitioners in on the on this webinar to think about you know how could they be more open and supportive to research efforts on, on behalf of, of agencies and you know being open to partner with researchers. Um, there are a lot of issues that Jeff mentions that you know are still you know like prevalence data you know does not ask questions of people with dementia. So you know we we so there is a whole lot we don't know yet. But but I think as we keep inching forward that that provides us with more knowledge all the time and and so i i would not want the result of attending this webinar for people to throw up their hands and saying you know where do i start um i i would encourage you to start with you know the improvements you can make in your own in your own place in your own program like we can we can work on specifying outcomes we can work on getting better measurements um, we can work on specifying our interventions a little better um, for the social workers out there, you know, this magic of practice wisdom and kind of what we do in the relationship, I, I believe all of that, you know, but, you know, are there characteristics of relationship development we can actually study? I mean, so, which, so there are lots of things that we can do. That's great, because we did get another question come in while you were talking. How can someone as a client manager help to make changes? And so I think, you know, Echoing what you're saying, identifying the outcomes that you could be looking for or that you're aiming for and how to measure them and, and all that. That's real good practical advice. Do any of you have anything else to add to that? How can we as client managers help to make changes? All right, I'll go on to the, another one that was similar. If we have an agency ready and willing for research, how do we, we how do we reach researchers in the field to encourage them to help us develop this necessary work? Can I start with that one? <laughs> um, um, well, I work for Wayne State School of Social Work, and one of the things that we've done as a school is we have we try to set up partnerships with community-based organizations and agencies. And, and so I think if you do have a university near you, <clears throat> that's, you know, reaching out to, you know, the criminal justice, the social work, the public health people at that university is one way to get started. Because there's actually, you know, people doing, who are scholars and, you know, faculty members and so affiliated with universities who need to do research to maintain their academic careers. And so, these partnerships can end up being quite fruitful. It doesn't mean they're easy, but they can end up being quite fruitful. And I'll let the funder may want to say something. About that too. Well, I, I'm going to yes, jump in and I'm say, say, turn it over to Jeff. Oh, right. Well, I I wasn't sure which funder you were you were talking well, about. I do, I do I do want to mention though that the Center for Victim Research has a researcher directory of people researchers who have stepped forward and said they are interested in working with practitioners. And we also have a number of tools on our website about how to work collaboratively together. Joy, you just alluded to the fact that it's not always easy, that you have to develop a good working relationship. And then with that, I'll step back and see if Kia or Jeff has anything to add. Yeah, I, I, th th these are all like really uh, great tips and, and we um, experience quite a bit of this, especially with um, some of our other violence topics, in including um, prevention of sexual violence, where the state programs say, hey, we have this really great innovative program. How can we uh, get this evaluated and um, scaled up, you know, at a national level? And fortunately, we've we've been able to support that that research. Um, I think it's also um, seeking out the funders, um, which it may not be CDC, but there are other federal agencies that actually do um, support um, research in the prevention of elder abuse and neglect. 
And, um, you know, I think that that's also another, um, like if someone's interested, share some information with Susan and then we could potentially try to filter that to some of our federal partners because there is a um, an interagency federal work group that uh, focuses on um, elder justice and um, both Kia and I are members of that work group. All right. Um, we had a question from early on in the presentation when you were talking about prevalence and the question was, um, do, do those figures include trans and gender non-conforming elders? Yeah, the, um, the prevalence estimates for the non-fatal um, assaults are based on hospitalization admissions, and that is for all persons. So that is everyone who, meet, who met a certain um, criterion point, which I believe was age 60 years and older. Um, what's unfortunate about the, uh, the data, and um, you could actually um, query the data yourself, um, on the CDC website, it's the Web-Based Injury Statistics Query and Reporting System, or Whiskers. And I don't know if I if I plant the URL in the chat on our end, can this be shared with everyone? But yes, um, I, I'll grab it there and share it with everyone. Go ahead. Um, that you that it may be possible to break down both the homicide data as well as the non-injury data by um, sex as well as um, um, sexual orientation and gender identity. I believe some of those variables may be in there. Um, for the data that we reported in that 2019 report, we did not break out the data for the hospitalizations because the data were unstable because a large majority of the cases didn't report the contextual information. But the contextual information is indeed reported with the uh, fatal injury data. All right. We have had another question come in. Does the CDC only look at physical and sexual abuse, or do you also look at neglect and financial abuse? In terms of um, the data that are included in our surveillance system, that it would mainly involve the physical abuse and the sexual abuse that would result in either a visit to the emergency room at the hospital or um, uh, would unfortunately result in um, in um, an unfit, you know, a homicide or a death. Um, for the financial exploitation and abuse, again, I believe there are other federal agencies that focus on that, and um, that might be the um, the Agency for Community Living. Um, and I'm trying to think of the other um, federal agency that could potentially focus on that. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Yes. muted while I was typing. Um, someone asked, isn't there a major difference between APS and victim services, such as APS deals mostly with self-neglect and victim services, such as uh, DV agencies focus on those who are victimized by others? Yes, but adult protective services, certainly, you know, the majority, well, the numbers have changed a little bit since financial exploitation has gotten more um, um, prominent. So, so, but in, but many adult protective services agencies, yes, the majority of their caseload is self-neglect. Um, however, it is not the only thing that they deal with, and they deal with uh, physical abuse, they deal with financial exploitation, they deal with emotional abuse, then they deal with caregiver neglect by caregivers, and and so. I think, you know, and, and so yes, and there's also a whole lot of stuff that victim services does, which is responding to the needs of victims of other crimes not committed by family members, that of course there's there's major differences. But but I, I wanted to highlight um, just in terms of the research evidence that both are fields where um, where there's a lot going on and these are the major responses when you know we say to someone some doctor you should report elder abuse well they have to go to APS or to victim services I mean or to the legal system and so so we need to be thinking about you know how those services are also responding to and then also being evaluated and um, studied in terms of the effectiveness of those interventions as well and there's there's a lot of complexity attached to that because of the complexity of the situations that these services deal with. 
and yes, there are there are major philosophical differences, but I think Dr. Jackson in her article was trying to point out that there's some significant overlap as well that and with more victim services serving older adults, the two pro the two set types of services need to communicate and talk with each other. <clears throat> Uh, and we had someone offer a, a follow-on comment to the uh, statistical question earlier, saying that homicide data is found in the supplemental FBI homicide reports and is broken down by gender and race and shows major changes over the last 10 years. And now we've had a question, a child abuse is mandated to be reported. Is elder abuse reporting mandated? Do yes. you all know? I know that's a little further yes. field for this. Oh. <laughs> um, Yes, in 49 of the 50 states, we have mandatory reporting laws, I think. Um, I know my colleagues who may be on this webinar, if they could speak up, they could correct me if I'm wrong. But um, New York State does not have mandatory reporting, um, but, but all the other states do. And the states vary about who is mandated to report and under what circumstances. But in most every state, it is doctors. And so, for example, getting more doctors to take that responsibility on has been one focus of research efforts and of APS and others. Mm -hmm. And we had a comment that echoes one of the points you all made earlier that elder victims a lot of times only have their abusers to help them. So it is hard for them to reach out. Uh, Kia, I believe this one is for you. Do any of the review reports you've summarized include content that summarizes priorities for future research? Um, in a way, yes. So the authors um, at the end, they kind of talked about future research and what should be looked at, and that's what kind of we included to look at um, more rigorous evaluation, looking at measurement, um, looking at, at the age range, um, looking at uh, policies. So they definitely include that information. It's also included in our systematic review. We had a question, can you provide a specific list or explain more about the risk and protective factors for elder abuse and prevention interventions for those factors? I know that's that's a pretty long question. Yes, and Jeff might be typing it in the chat box. Um, on our webpage, we list out the risk, some risk and protective factors. Great. So we and can I'll definitely share that. that. And I also want to let people know that on the CVR website, um, mm -hmm. under research, we did some um, some research summaries, our research syntheses ourselves. One was on elder abuse, mm -hmm. and that included risk and protective factors. But I will um, look and and forward on um, any other reference that's in in the Q and A box or the chat. You can uh, also another question. Oh, sorry. Oh, just, just the National Center on Elder Abuse link also links to a lot of good, good information on that as well. <clears throat> uh, Kia, what was the impetus for doing the systematic review of reviews? Um, it started from the um, technical packages that we released, and there wasn't one for elder abuse. So we wanted to take a look at the literature and to see what was out there, um, because I know the other fields are, even though elder abuse field has you know, been around, has been researched, um, for um, to see what was out there in the field. So that's what kind of got us started to look at this in more detail. Sorry, I was muted while I was trying to type <laughs> this great um, resource that is now in the chat box for everyone. All right, another question that came in. Uh, Kia, on the results slide, which I believe was slide 18, can you clarify mm -hmm. what meant what went into determining the quality rating when you were looking at these reviews? What made evidence strong as compared to moderate? Thank you for that. Um, so when you get the slide deck, it is correct, slide 18, and at the bottom there's um, the, the link to the information. Oh. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the bottom, we use a quality assessment tool for reviews, and it's based on seven questions, and we coded them as yes, no, um, unknown, and undetermined. And then based on this, they were rated um, as strong if they were scored six out of seven yes, moderated if four out of five were coded as yes, and then weak if three or fewer were coded as yes. 
And the questions um, revolved around um, the inclusion criteria, um, strengths, weaknesses, if the reviewers, um, if the system of review went beyond um, just looking at the outcomes, but kind of talked about, okay, so what's next? Um, so those were some of the questions that were used to determine the quality rating. All right, it looks like we have reached the end of the question period and we are actually a little bit over time. I want to thank the three of you. This has been fascinating. It has inspired me to promote more research in this area so that we can get some answers. Um, and it sounds like this is really an area that is ripe for growth. And it's so good to know that both the CDC is taking this on and the world of social workers and their professors <laughs> and uh, NAPSA's research to practice uh, interest group is really trying to make that happen. So again, thank, thank you so much for presenting. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today for your interest in this topic. And hopefully we can all work together and be back in a year to see what, what maybe five years, okay, we're talking research, um, see what difference we've made. All right. So with that, I'll bang the webinar closed and goodbye, everyone. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>